Well, today we are pleased to welcome to the studio Francis McLeod, a founding partner of the Forensic Risk Alliance. Francis, welcome. Hi, Hi Richard. It's nice to see you. And we're going to talk about your first piece in the FCPA blog, We Need to Audit Culture Change Too. Um, but before we do a little bit about yourself, you graduated Oxford with your master's degree, got into a career in investment banking, then founding the FRA and talking about auditing culture change. So tell us a little bit about that trajectory. Right. Well, that, yes, Richard, as, as, you, as you mentioned, um, I started out my career as an M&A banker. Um, and part of that was spent actually in, in um, China, Hong Kong and in Indonesia. Okay. So without intending, I got quite a bit of exposure to some interesting business practices, sure. including during my time in the mid 90s in, in Indonesia with really rampant corruption right. um, and and saw what that did to retard the development of the, of the country. Um, fast forward a few years and I was headhunted to become involved in the Swiss bank investigations into Holocaust era assets. Oh and that prompted a career change. And at the end of that project, and some other Holocaust related uh, long tail mm -hmm. asset investigations, uh, along with someone I'd met during uh, those, Greg Mason um, and Toby Duthie, we set up FRA. Um, and since then have been very intimately involved in a number of FCPA related matters and um, continue to go to, from strength to strength and, and grow on the basis of offering advice and investigative services and compliance uh, consulting around anti bribery and corruption. Well, terrific, thank you. So let's talk about this article, Culture and Audit, right? It's a fascinating <laughs> piece. Um, I mean, culture is such a narrative word. In the article, even you share how it's a soft issue. So, I mean, can we really measure and audit culture? And Francis, sh should we be? What's the value of that? So I'd say yes to both of those things. Um, obviously, a, a lot of what we do, and many of my colleagues have backgrounds originally in financial audit, public mm -hmm. accounting. Um, and a lot of what we do when we're measuring various um, peak parts of a compliance program when it relates to anti-bribery and corruption is, is looking at controls and looking at sort of hard, as you say, hard uh, right. numbers and, and hard financial controls and, and um, all of the work that goes into around that. But always an important part of the work that we do also when we're working with council is assessing tone at the top. You know, mm -hmm. what, what are management doing to create the correct messaging around the importance of being compliant with anti-bribery um, sure. and corruption regulation, but also you know, the, the ethical spirit, how does that work? Um, and I found myself a little bit frustrated sometimes about how that is measured really in the form of pretty light touch interviews, sometimes more aggressive interviews, but again, very much um, in, a, in a softer environment. And it's very rare that you'll interview someone and say, well, how do you feel about ethics? Or how do you feel about corporate right. governance? Or how do you feel about the importance of not paying bribes? People are all going to say, oh, passionately, passionately concerned about that. Of course, of course. I'm very committed to <laughs> to all of these things. There's only one right answer correct. to those questions. Correct. <laughs> and, and the other piece we find <laughs> is that companies, it's a little bit of a sensitive area. So um, in, in looking at this, I, I sort of thought, well, no, there has to be some way of doing this in a way that's more rigorous and, and almost in a way that is like a, a an audit that you would do with mm -hmm. these other areas. And I looked at thinking of how you could combine some of the, the skills that, for example, people who do um, personality assessments, uh, psychiatric evaluations okay. and so on, how maybe we could look at leveraging that, how we could look at leveraging the intelligence that is, is in an organization, whether that might be way of survey, focus groups, um, having leadership do self-assessments, but also crafting that in a way that strips out the subjectivity. Uh, because I think I, as a business owner myself, I'm probably not entirely objective when I think about what my corporate culture is like. I know what right. I'd like it to be, but I, I'm, I'm a big fan of empirical evidence and I'm a big fan of retesting, just as you would in any other sure. uh, area of, of, of anti-bribery and corruption. So I think if you create these mechanisms to uh, pull together data that are designed in a way to get that data to be as objective as possible, you can then retest those results periodically to see if, are improvements coming on board, um, is, it, is, is tone at the top and is, is cultural embrace of, of ethical behavior, is it constant, is it improving, is it declining, are people becoming jaded? Um, gives you lots of different touch points. And, and so it's something we're going to continue, to, I think, to develop in, into making it more of a, a rigorous, robust testing area. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a number of projects currently where I suspect the evolution of this auditing of culture will continue and will give us 
great opportunities to um, exert more rigor in this area and to give corporates the information they need to really be able to measure culture effectively. So you talk about empirical data, measurements, effectiveness, and in the post, in, in your article, you talked about different tools and different measurements. So for a company that's never really done a deep drill into this issue, what might you recommend for at least an initial start? What might be some of those tools they can think about? So I think, you know, we all talk about tone at the top and how effective mm -hmm. is the messaging around that. Um, and I think a lot of, of, of effort can be committed to that at a senior level. But to really see how effective the trickle down is, um, I would suggest an, an employee survey. Um, and the correct selling around that of the importance of the survey. Yeah. Um, it, it's fascinating to me, but I have seen some really low uptake results uh, when companies try and do this, even after they've had an issue. Right. Um, so you can leverage, I think, the perfect time to do this, for example, is after a company has identified an issue mm -hmm. in the ABC area. Um, they, they've got the benefit of everyone being aware of it. You can do good messaging around it. We had an issue. We sure. worked out why it happened. We're doing the remediation. And by the way, we'd like to do a survey. And we think it's incredibly important that all of you, and I would do it at a company-wide survey, mm -hmm. uh, take part in this. And then the other critical piece is to have that survey be designed in a way that allows for it very um, not yes, no answers. You need to build right. in, you know, that the ability from, you know, don't agree at all to agree very strongly to give you that gradient um, mm -hmm. of response. And that gives you then, I think, a baseline for your initial data set. And then as areas are identified, um, you can work out what needs to happen to improve the messaging around that, improve culture. And culture changes, we know, can be slow. Yes. And, and so it then allows you that baseline, so then retesting in six months or in a year or even a shorter period of time if you've got some very specific goals around a specific issue um, can be very effective. So are these anonymous surveys in terms of how you might sort of break down the data? I, I think that's very important. Um, you know, we do a lot of work in, in Brazil, for example, where and it was very funny, somebody told me this on day two. Oh, you realize we have a retaliation culture. And I said, what does that mean? And they said, well, you know, people know here that, you know, historically, I mean, it's, it's sort of part of our character trait, which I thought was very damning, is if somebody whistle blows, the chances are, you know, they're going to be penalized mm -hmm. for that. So we see a lot of Brazilian companies doing work around creating whistleblower hotlines, but a lot around messaging that it can be done anonymously, no one can track it, there will not be retaliation. Even if you don't want to do things anonymously, there'll be support around that. So I think in a lot of cultures, frankly, even in our own, um, adding the protection of a, an anonymous survey is, is really important. Would you break it down at least by support function so you know the data from this group is a little bit different than the and, data and, and from you, another group? And you group? may calibrate your question slightly differently depending okay. on, on support function. So a lot of what we do is, is around uh, empowering the finance function. So mm -hmm. people in a, in a financial control function are de facto gatekeepers of the finances of the company. But frequently, they haven't necessarily made the correlation between being gatekeepers in terms of safeguarding the assets sure. for, for profitability's purposes um, to making the connection that you're also at the front line of, of anti-bribery and corruption That's compliance right. because you're the people that can say no to the payment. You can question the rationale for why it's been authorized. We do a lot of work around that. And I, I think a lot of value add could be had around making these surveys function specific to really partly to, to help us, you know, you can even use them as part of the education, but also to get the data back that allows you to, okay, this hasn't maybe resonated with this particular function in the same way as it has in another function. So it sounds a little bit like a corporate 360. So the C-suite might think we have great culture, but your finance division or human resources doesn't think exactly like you do. Correct. And they may be subject to different pressures. Sure. So, yeah. And then what happens when the data comes back? So the data comes back and, and us being people who love to, to uh, slice and dice the data, we would right. uh, come out with findings and, and weightings based on each of the questions, um, probably come out with some recommendations as to areas for improvement or areas that maybe require retesting. Mm -hmm. If you know, if, if, we, if, it, if the results are, are either very surprising or, or seem counterintuitive or counterproductive or we've got incredibly mixed results, so you sort of essentially do the best you can to secure the quality of the data. Uh, then you report based on that, and then that can lead into developing an action plan for improvement of areas of weakness that have been identified. Um, and that would then be agreed with compliance, with senior right. management, with, with stakeholders as to what the best way forward with that would be. And who might lead that effort internally? 
So you have all this data, you have best practices that you want to try to implement to, to make some improvements. Is there ownership of that change? Well, I, I have a, I'm a big fan of, and it, it sits in different organizations and in, in different, in different um, groups and different organizations. So, you know, I have seen, I see some companies that have a compliance office, which is distinct from an ethics office, although they discuss things sure. with each other. Um, I think HR is incredibly important in this too, because um, HR is frequently tasked with surveying, mm -hmm. is clearly tasked with looking after the well-being of uh, staff and so on. So I would suggest, depending on where it sits within the organization, uh, probably a number of stakeholders really to ensure effective results. And certainly as far as the readout goes, clearly senior management should be involved right. because this really goes to the heart of who are you and how are you behaving in a broader ethical context, not just the anti-bribery and corruption one. I mean, it seems like if you ask 10 compliance leaders to define culture, you'll probably get 20 answers, one better than the next. So do you start this exercise off with, let's first define culture? And is that something that's coming from you, from your client to you, or do you take a lead in that at all? I, a lot of it has to be driven by the client, I think, um, mm -hmm. because ultimately it, it's their business and they know what they're striving for, even if they don't know exactly where right. they're sitting currently. Um, and I think um, it's this idea of marrying the sort of ethical culture, the, the tone at the top mm -hmm. and from the bottom up, because we always talk about top down and bottom up in our world of, of testing all of these things, sure. um, of, of marrying that too with a broader purpose. So I think if you have a purpose of your, your company and that sits very well with your ethical mm -hmm. barometer, uh, that's something that, that you know, obviously we, we always have, we have views, I'm sure you have views right. as well, um, but I think it's something that you, we, and we might nudge in certain directions, but I think it ultimately should be defined by the company itself with maybe us as consultants on the side to, again, try and force this objectivity mm -hmm. into, the, into, the, into the discussion. There's a lot of data and surveys around middle level management and how very often that culture gets either amplified or distorted or maybe even discarded at that middle level management. Is that something that you've seen, especially for a globally dispersed workforce where the tone at the top is usually that regional manager? It's, it's interesting that you say that because I think we see a lot of compliance issues a reflection of how far away from head office you are, right. particularly if the bulk of resource around the compliance function, around risk management, around internal audit are sitting at head office. Um, and then the other the other thing that we also see is, and we, I'm, you know, I'm not naive to, <clears throat> to think that there's an open checkbook as regards compliance right. um, either, but frequently when it gets pushed out to the regions or down to middle management, it's have another job on top of your normal day job. Sure. And I think it's hard at that mid middle management level also to be able to triage what it is your, your major priority is. So I, I do think there's a lot of work um, that could be re very beneficial and again, have to be done in a cost effective fashion to test around messaging because those are the guys that are under a lot of pressure as you, as you point out. Yeah, it's really where you know corruption and commerce can really collide in, in some of these operations. And what about the role of internal audit, right? So we talk about data measurement and sort of keeping this process going. Can internal resources be used in this process? I'm a huge fan of internal audit. Um, I, I uh, you know, we, we spend a lot of our time training internal auditors who don't have a background in compliance mm -hmm. testing and how to leverage their skills um, and, and you know, help them develop an FCPA module to do some testing around this and also around other risk areas. Um, so I think, and they frequently, if they are staffed correctly, do have people with the skills with the audit sure. background to be able to do this. That being said, um, I think the starting point for one of these these exercises on, on auditing culture does need to be through that lens of okay. objectivity. And so getting some external impartial input uh, into, into the whole um, design of the program or the initiative that you're going to be undertaking is important. That being said, I think with the right training and supervision, mm -hmm. and certainly during the life cycle of the audits, sure. um, I see no reason why you couldn't leverage internal resources. And it might be a combination between HR and internal audit. It could just be internal audit. It depends what resources made the most sense. But um, I, I think that's a great idea. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing some time with us today, and I hope this will just be your first post on the FCPA blog. Thank you, Richard. It was a pleasure. Likewise.